All right, so I'm going to start here by going a little bit through my code and kind of incorporating some of these, these ideas and see if we can make make things work. I hope my Python installation works because just earlier today suddenly um, code was telling me I didn't have a Python interpreter installed and I had to kind of reinstall a bunch of stuff and I don't know why. It seemed to be lost even though it was there and so on and so forth. Has anyone had this kind of problem in Python? Anyway, so here's hoping everything will will look nice. So the first thing I kind of added here and then we'll comment them in really, really soon. All right. Okay, so at least left works. Ah, uh, okay. Going right, why is that not working? We have global going left, right, up and down here. Do we not have all that in the, oh, here. Okay. So we have some way of controlling what's happening. It's not gonna be a great way of controlling because once I hit the button, I just start moving in that direction and not stop. Then I can hit the button in the other directions and it'll just go all over the place. Okay, left, right, up, down. Yes. You need to cancel out the movement. If you press right, you have also to cancel out going left. Um, so when you're going left equals true, when you have to say going right equals false. Well, do I have to really? Because so going, oh no, okay. You're going in two separate directions. At the yeah, same yeah, time. I know. That does not work out. Uh, well, what I was going to do actually was this. Make sure that these are all on the key up as well. You can do false, oops, place. Just to make sure that it stops once I release the button. But I'm okay with it canceling each other out when I hold both of them. Elif, 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 if. All right. So now I can do this and back and all directions. But it still works like this because even though I'm even though I am kind of setting the boolean value to false when I release, I'm not kind of stopping this here. It's not until someone else adds to it. Either way, I'm going to change this a little bit. Put this to something much smaller, say 0 0.2. 0 0.2. So this would be really slow, I imagine, except what I'm going to do is I'm going to do plus equals. What am I doing now? Is 0 0.2 now my speed? Like originally, 3 was my speed. When I hit the button, I went on a speed 3 in the x dimension. What is 0 0.2 now? Acceleration. It's acceleration. So every single frame I'm adding to the speed. So let's see how this looks. I can hit the button. I can hold it and it goes faster. I can hold it the other direction. It becomes this much more fun, smooth kind of way of moving things around. And then I lost it. Okay, so motion acceleration stuff. Now I'm now I actually have a reason to work with the vector instead of just working with the position directly. So I'm playing around with a vector. Um, my buttons are affecting this vector, which is my speed, and then you can do all kinds of things and, and play around with that. There are some ideas in the in the uh, assignment description or the exercise description. So play around with vectors a little bit, get vectors working, have them control your motion. There's another thing I want to add now. And from now on, I kind of want this to be something that you incorporate into all of your assignments. And that is the fact that 
I want to stop making our motion be a certain amount of motion for each frame and instead be a certain amount of motion per time unit, that is motion per second. So seeing as I can have a really fast computer and a really slow computer, if I always just add a constant value to a position for every frame, the slow computer with a low frame rate will simply move things slower. So you look at the two screens side by side and the games just won't be happening at the same speed. So we don't want this to happen. Even though something has a bad frame rate, we still want things to look like they're moving at the same speed. So two games side by side, they'll be moving at the same speed, just one will look a little bit smoother than the other. So, of course, we want things to be as smooth as possible. That is, we want as high a frame rate as we can. So we don't want to do this by pausing one computer every single frame so that we slow it down to match the other computer. That's not a great way to do it. Instead, we want to say, I want each computer to be able to render as many frames as it possibly can every second. I just want to control how big the motion within the frame is depending on that frame rate. Does this make sense? Yes. Yes? There's at least one person that this makes sense to. So at the beginning of my update function, I am now going to take... Well, let's start with this here. And go here. And now I'm going to add a global delta time, and I'm going to add delta time to our variables up here. Delta time, and just say equals zero to begin with. Because we are going to, well, no, delta time actually doesn't need to be here. What we want is we want something that we're going to call clock. You can just say that equals none to begin with. So when we initialize, I'm going to say global clock. This is going to be an instance of a class that can tell me how much time has elapsed since the last frame. So I have this clock variable here, and I'm going to say clock equals uh, pygame. So pygame is kind of our window manager or our um, operating system manager here, pygame.time dot, and then there's a function called uh, clock, or there should be a function called clock, like so. And so when I'm initializing my game, I set clock to a new clock object. And this clock object has operations to give me the time. I'm only interested in one operation now. And that is that every time I call update, I'm now going to use this variable clock, and I'm going to say global clock. Every time I start update, I'm going to store a value. And that value, this tick function, simply gives me the time in milliseconds since the tick function was last called. So I say tick, and it tells me how long it is since I last called it. So if I do this at the beginning of every single frame, that means that in every frame, tick will give me um, basically the length of the last frame. That is, how long did it take for me to render the previous frame? Does that make sense? So I'm actually going to do one tick here at the beginning as well. So clock just to kind of reset it to make sure that the first tick we call won't be huge so the first frame will be enormous. Can we do it here at the bottom? So in every update function, we're going to get this delta time. I am, however, going to divide it by 1,000 <coughs> so that I get the time in seconds. That's just for me to have an easier time thinking, okay, I want this to move this much per second. So what do I do with this delta time now? Like, what can I do with it in my motion here? 
let's forget about the acceleration for a while and just think about what do I want the motion like how do I want this delta time to affect it so my motion is now not a vector that is this much movement per frame it's this much movement per second you can imagine that it's a speed in meters per second so in order to take that and get the correct amount of motion for the particular length that I have now it means if I have a higher number in delta time I want a bigger motion because the last frame took a long time to render and that means I need to kind of catch up with that that time if it's a small number I want a small motion so I want to say this times delta time delta time so now I guess I need to overload a function for multiplying a vector with a scalar right I guess that's called mult and I'm gonna put that on vector because that's not really defined so to begin with do I really have to return oh, I guess to begin with I'm gonna add this to vectors as well then I'm going to define is this correct can someone find out what's the correct term if this isn't I guess self other and since in this case other is a scalar and not a I'm gonna say self dot X ah, okay okay uh, yeah, yeah, yeah so add should really make a new uh, okay let's keep it like this but to keep, make this correct we should really make a new instance of point and add to it and then return that, right? Yes? No, if you can use whatever you want to do this. I'm just, this is just to make your code nicer. And you can make your code nicer in any way. The stuff that doesn't have to do with OpenGL in particular or the actual vector math that we're kind of doing, you can, you can use other ways to do that. So if it's vector math, we have to implement ourselves. Yeah, but not necessarily to the point of kind of adding vectors to one another. More like the methods that we build to where we use that. Anyway, I'm going to go down here to self x. So I'm just going to do it like this again. Equals other. But since other is a scalar, I'm just going to use that directly. Self dot y. And then let's return although this doesn't matter that much in our case no this does yes plus equals no I can't do that because then I'd multiply it return it no it'll work sorry there was a question uh, it's mode, just not mode. is it okay like so Now suddenly I'm afraid of this using self there rather than instantiating a new one, but let's leave it at that. So now we're adding delta time. Let's just get this to run and see that it works. Okay, I'm going to have to add this in again because otherwise I, we have no motion. Like so. All right, my acceleration is still per frame. But let's let's just leave it at that and see if this changes how fast or slow things are. Is this the old window? Didn't I stop that originally? All right, let's get this rolling. Computer, please.
something happening or nothing happening? Can you see? It's moved slightly. Yeah, it moved slightly, didn't it? Or is it trickling? No, it's actually moving. I'm holding in the acceleration button, so it's moving faster and faster and faster. At some point, it'll start. Okay. So obviously, we're working in an entirely different scale here. So we're going to need to update kind of our our speeds and our accelerations. So this is like 0 0.2 pixels per second per second. So we're going to need something a little bit bigger. Let's see what 20 does. Just to get things going. But again, this is acceleration. So this is um, a squared function, basically. So by going from 0 0.2 to 20, the speed is not really going to grow 100-fold, but 10,000-fold. For whatever reason, though, I'm kind of capping out on the acceleration. Anyway, you can go ahead and... Uh, yeah, okay, this obviously needs to be times delta time as well, right? So we're multiplying delta time with our acceleration as well, so that this is also per second. So this is something we have to remember. Delta time, our kind of time factor, will have to be multiplied onto every single speed and acceleration and motion. Can I see the multiplication or function again? Yes. I'm just going to see if this is working better now. Nope. Yeah, the multiplication function, did I do it wrong? Here. Could also just return vector self x times other self y times other. And this would be a much more correct way to do this. Again, here we could return vector self x plus other x, self y plus other y. And finally, here we can do the same, except we're going to return a point. Feeling this is more correct. Okay, so the acceleration is actually kind of accelerating. So now we can just go ahead and, and you know see how we can affect the numbers and make sure we don't. So if we make this even bigger. 200 here. It'll happen fast, but then we can maybe slow it down fast as well. So this is taking a little bit longer than I uh, expected, but I was going to show you kind of a few more things, like taking an angle and using that uh, to control speed as well. That is, have kind of angle and a speed and build a vector from that, <coughs> number one. And then I wanted to look at a few functions that we can use in OpenGL, and I kind of wanted to get those in now. So I'm going to see. We've done more or less this idea here. Um, what I wanted to look at was a little bit about these matrix functions that we have in OpenGL, these transformation functions that we have in OpenGL. And we'll look a lot better at them when we start looking at transformations, but it's nice to just have a feel for how they work. So now, 
instead of having position x here, I'm going to do this a little bit differently. I'm going to build this triangle a little differently and say I'm just going to draw it as if it's positioned in 0, 0. So I'm going to have a vertex that's, let's say, minus 50, minus 50. The last vertex I'm going to have 50, minus 50. So these are kind of the bottom two vertices. And then I'm going to have one a little bit higher and have it at 0 in the x dimension and let's say 100 in the other dimension. So if I draw this, we're not going to expect to see any, you know, it's going to just going to be drawn with its center in 0, 0, right? So it's down there, down here in the corner. That's more or less what we expected. Uh, 0, 100. However, I'm going to take this out here, draw it again, just to make sure that doesn't affect it. Okay, yeah, I expected it to be a, a little bit steeper like that. However, now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use a function that's called GL translate. So GL translate simply tells OpenGL, I'm going to draw as if I'm drawing with the center in 0, 0. But I want you to take everything that I've put in there and I want you to add this to it. So translate is simply takes in x dimension, y dimension, and z dimension. So let's say we're going to put in position dot x here, position dot y, and just zero for z since we're working in, in 2D. So I'm adding GL translate here before I draw. So everything that happens after I call GL translate will be affected by that particular transformation. Okay, so now it's moved. And now I can actually use the same motion as before since that's affecting my variable position. And now that I'm translating to position every time, it'll be drawn in a new position every time. So instead of me actually taking position and adding it to some values myself inside the GL vertex functions, I'm calling GL vertex the same every time with the same values. This will make it so much easier for us to start using vertex lists later on, where you just have these huge vertex lists that represent a whole model and we just throw them in the same every single time. We can even throw them down to the hardware and have the hardware read them again and again and again every frame without changing them because the position is just part of the transformation and the transformation will happen in the vertex shader. All right, there are a couple more things that I have here. This is one, GL push matrix and GL pop matrix. And then I have GL matrix mode, GL model view, and that's just to make sure that push matrix and pop matrix affect the correct matrix. That's the model view matrix. And the only one we have to worry about for now is the model view matrix. So it's just nice to make sure that this is called somewhere before we start drawing. So what GL push matrix does is it says, I'm going to take the transformation, like all the accumulated transformations, like GL translate. If I call it GL translate again, that'll accumulate. If I call GL rotate and then translate and then rotate again and then scale again, all of these will add up into one monstrous transformation. What GL push matrix allows me to do is to say, I have a transformation now of accumulated transformation functions, <coughs> and I want to store that as it is, because I want to use it later. Like I'm going to draw an object here, then I'm going to translate somewhere away from it and draw an object there, but then I have to get back to here, because this is the center of a planet, and I'm going to draw its moons. So I always want to get back to here. So I take the current transformation and I put it on a stack and I save it. If I call push matrix again, I'll take whatever transformation I now have, put it on top of the stack and continue. So I can always affect my current transformation because I've taken it and saved it on the stack at different times. When I call GL pop matrix, I simply take the topmost transformation from this stack and I overwrite the current transformation with it. Make sense? 
So my current transformation, I can affect in any way if I want to save it as is. In this case, I'm simply saving, saving the transformation before I start doing anything. But I can't just load an identity matrix because there is stuff in the model view matrix. For instance, where my camera is, where my world window is. There are things like this that are already in there. So I don't want to ruin those by simply overriding it with an identity matrix. Instead, I store it as is with GL push matrix. Then I call something like GL translate. I could call GL rotate now. In that case, I have a variable somewhere that's called angle, if I recall correctly. And that's basically an angle in degrees. Then the second, or there are three more variables, and these are simply, uh, this is simply a vector. And it's the vector I want to rotate around. <coughs> Seeing as I'm in two dimensions, the only vector that it makes sense to rotate around is 0, 0, 1, being kind of the vector that's sticking directly out of the whiteboard or such. So in two dimensions, this is always the way we call GL rotate. In, uh, in three dimensions, we're going to start working a little bit with different vectors. So that angle is 24 degrees. So we should see that it moves to where it's supposed to be. And then it rotates there by 24 degrees. All right. So that makes sense. So every single frame, it first moves to where position is, then it rotates, which means I'm not adding anything to the rotation. In order to add to the rotation, we would have to do what? We would have to somewhere in our update function do something like, if we're going left, I'm going to also say angle plus equals, we can just say actually angle equals minus 30. And if we're going right, angle equals 30. And that way we can affect this angle as well. And we can probably see it when we, when we run. So here we have our object. All right, so that's a bit choppy. Obviously, we could do a plus equals and an acceleration on that as well. So it, it happens smoothly. But what we can also do if we just want this to always be directed in the direction that we're moving. That makes sense to us, right? So if we just want to take the direction that we're moving in and say, I want that to be where this is headed, then I'm going to change this a little bit and say, if I'm going left, I'm going to do angle plus equals um, 180 degrees per second sounds nice. 180 times delta time. Uh, plus equals is actually wrong for left. I think left would be, no, left would be plus equals. Right would be minus equals. OK, for now, let's not change the position. Okay, so I've got this now. Now I'm changing the angle, but I also want this angle to decide my kind of heading, where I'm going. So who has a nice solution for that? So if I'm now going to say, all right, I have a completely different program. I'm not kind of moving it in these four directions. I just want to rotate in any direction I want, and then I want to go there. <coughs> So how can my acceleration work? And I'd like it to work in such a way that when I push the up button, I go in the direction that I'm headed. Use cosine and sine of the angle. OK. So we have the angle. So we have math as well. I think I've already imported that. I'm just going to show you those lines. OK, so from math import star, that means I can use sine and cosine without doing math.sine and math.cosine. And we are now here. OK, so the C, no, so the x value would be the cosine 
of the angle, except this takes radians. So we're going to have to do times uh, 1 half pi. Sorry. Yeah, I can use pi, I guess. Oh, it's going to take a while. Lowercase pi. And let's just do angle dot pi divided by 180. So, okay, now I've changed the angle from degrees to radians. That's fine, but I need to add this to something, right? So this is kind of my new vector. So I can now say, I'm going to say my motion vector, I'm kind of building that on the fly, right? But instead, I'm going to take motion out here so we... I can just find motion so to make sure that I'm... Okay, we're using it here. We're not <coughs> using it anywhere else. Fine. So I'm just going to make my motion vector here and say motion now equals a new vector that has x this and the y will be the sine of same. Angle times pi divided by 180 degrees. And I guess we'll just do an else here. Um, motion equals vector zero zero. No. Oh, never mind. We don't need the else. I'm mixing together acceleration and speed. Okay, so. Uh, all right. You can stop me when I'm doing things wrong as well. So I'm thinking, yes, we need, I'm going to stick to motion. So we need motion here. We need here motion equals, because we're just changing the acceleration there. Motion equals vector 0, 0. Start with that. So we're, we'll put our speed here, make sure that's big enough. may or may not use that. So if going up, I've made, I'm going to change this to acceleration equals this. And then we say motion <coughs> plus equals acceleration times delta time. But we might need to and put a fixed value on this as well. Times delta time times, let's try 10. Then every time we do position plus equals motion times delta time. Let's see if this works. All right, invalid syntax here. Is it here? Uh, I'm missing a parenthesis here. True. Thanks. All right. So I can turn. Okay. It's not happening in the correct direction. <coughs> this is probably because, well, can anyone tell me why this is? Because cosine kind of imagines that, so cos and sine kind of imagine that zero degrees is here. So, but I'm drawing my spaceship like this, so it's kind of going in this direction. We could flip cos and sine <coughs> if we want to still imagine our spaceship going upwards as its kind of base position. 
or we could draw the spaceship in another in another way. In my case, I am going to just flip cos and sine here and say if I want it to be up if I want it to be up as its base position, that means zero would be sine cos, then it goes this direction. Yeah, it should be minus sine. I believe it would work like this. Minus sine for x, cos for y. Let's see. <coughs> okay, but it's super slow acceleration, so let's take this here, change it to 100 rather than 10. See what happens. Like so. And then I can slow down by just going the other direction. Oh, and I got a little floating spaceship going here. How about one more fun thing? One more thing, I want to use this position and direction to make another object with a certain speed. How does that sound? So when I hit space, I want another object to kind of shoot out of this object and get its position and a speed based on its direction. <laughs> and then we can kind of, you can edit that to make sure that its speed is also added to it and so on and so forth. So if we simply say, I'm going to make, I'm going to draw an extra point here. Let's go up first and say, we're going to make something that's called projectile position. We can just put that in the same spot. And here in the display function, we're going to use that as well. And I'm going to go down here. And after I draw this, I'm going to draw another thing. I'm going to do all of this again. No, I'm always going to put it over that, like so, like so. So projectile position X, projectile position Y. <coughs> um, let's get a different color here. Let's make this black. GL points. Uh, no need for rotation. And I'm just going to draw the one point, and I can put it in 0, 0. Right? Because I've translated to this position, then I'm just going to draw the point in zero, which will be exactly that position. Let's see if this at least draws to begin with. Should be a little black dot in the middle of the triangle. And it's there. We can see that when I move away, it just stays there not very big. There's some way we can actually make the points grow. Can someone Google larger points in OpenGL? And you'll get a little function. I don't remember exactly what it is at this point, but you can use that. So what we want to do is on key down, LF event.key equals k. Pretty sure it's space. Yes. GL point size. Okay. Um, I am going to use something like shooting equals true. And we need that variable as well. 
So let's. <coughs> Shooting, we're going to need this variable in display as well. No, not display. We're going to need it in update. And we're going to need to actually make this shooting. And we're going to need to put it in RG up event as well. In this case, it would actually be nice. Yeah, OK. Actually, all right, shooting equals false. I'm going to do a little <coughs> something once we do this to make sure it only happens once. As soon as I've kind of processed the fact that it's become true, I'm going to set it false again to make sure it only happens when I push the button and not you know, all the time while the button is down. <coughs> However, we can use this. Either way, so in update, I'm going to go ahead and say uh, if shooting, we will say projectile position equals point. Position dot x. Now we could also make kind of a copy function, but I'm not gonna. Position dot x. Position dot y. So we've got the po position correct. Now we need another thing. We need projectile speed, right? Projectile position. Projectile <coughs> motion equals vector zero zero. Let's just call this projectile speed. Make it equal 200. So motion should be up here. So in update, we we're going to need all of these projectile things. It's just taking a bit long, like so. There, 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 there. OK. So what happens when we shoot? We say the position of the projectile is this. We say projectile speed <coughs> equals vector. And what should we put into this vector? Like here, yeah, but, uh, kind of with a bigger speed. OK, so acceleration would be a vector like this times projectile speed. That might work. So OK, we're, we're again, we're just taking the spaceship itself, and we're saying it has a direction that it's kind of oriented in. That's the speed we want the projectile to get. In fact, in the end, we actually would want to add the spaceship's motion to it as well. Otherwise, when the spaceship is going fast, we're just leaving the projectile behind. So we might actually go ahead and say, we want this to be the motion, like the regular motion, plus this, plus the projectile speed. Um, what now? So now we have the projectile speed. I guess every single frame, we want the projectile position to plus equal projectile motion. Oops, this was supposed to be projectile motion. I don't know. I don't know what happens now. And actually, one thing I wanted to do, well, let's see what happens now, and then let's see the change. So 
So if I turn this around now, okay, it goes really fast. So it goes a little bit too fast. So let's just change projectile speed then to 20. Ah, okay, no. How? Okay, there's a thing I said earlier was really important to do everywhere, and I didn't do it here. Delta time. Delta time, thank you. So I was doing it 200 per frame and not 200 per second, which means there are probably like 50 to 100 frames in the second, so obviously it went too fast. So we have to make sure that delta time is happening here. And we have to make sure that this is motion plus this blah, 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 blah. No, we're actually not. This isn't an acceleration. We're just setting the projectile motion to a fixed thing. So that's just what we're going to set it to. And then we just add delta time to the change. So delta time is only to accumulative changes, not to just fixed speeds that we set up. So let's see if this works a little bit smoother this time. It was already running. It was already running. Great. Thank you. What did I do wrong now? Why is it running in this weird mode. Exit. Nope. Here's a classic way to do this. So there it is. There it goes. And you said it was GL point size, right? So I'm going to go just before I do GL points here. I don't have to do this inside display. I could just do this in the initialization if I'm going to do it once. GL point size, um, four. This is in pixels, so this is kind of a little bit different from the regular. So it won't grow or shrink with the window or viewport size. It's just a fixed number of pixels for the point. Like so. Okay, there it goes. However, if I hold space, it'll just stick there until I release it and then goes. Which is why I want to do one more thing. In the update function here, <coughs> I want to say, if shooting, all of this happens, and then I'm going to do shooting equals false. So it doesn't happen right again the next frame, which means I can press the button and it'll go without me releasing the button first. There are more ways to do this. It's just kind of keeping track of the values of your booleans. So there it goes. Obviously, I don't have several. You need a list of projectiles, adding each one every time, blah, 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 then making them kind of die and reuse their space in the list after they they're killed, but for now I just have the one, so if I shoot again, it goes. If I go fast, however, it kind of goes with me, like this. I can show you what happens if I skip the part where I actually add motion itself to it. So this is the spaceship's motion. If I skip adding that, I'm going to the side, and I kind of leave it behind. It doesn't really feel like this spaceship was shooting that projectile. It looks like I'm shooting it to the side rather than... Or if I go fast enough, I kind of just leave it there. 
So adding the motion of the spaceship itself. Whoa. Anyway, this took a long time, but I have a feeling we kind of made something fairly substantial. And if you couldn't follow anything I was doing here, I was recording this. I'll put the video online. A lot of this is kind of what I want you to do. So don't just go ahead and you know follow the video and say I finished this because I did everything I did. That's a, that's one way to do it. But sit down now after we've gone through this, and we still have like plenty of time. We have time to like 10 to 5. So you can sit down. You can do these things yourselves. There are some more things in the description. <coughs> the description is very open. It's not as much of a step by step as last time. You kind of just there's just ideas of things to do that you can use this type of motion and these types of objects. And take a little time today to kind of take some object like that spaceship and say, I'm going to make a class for it. And that class has its own update function that takes in the delta time variable. And it has a display function of its own. And then in the update function, I can just go through my list of spaceships and say, for each spaceship, update. And in my display function, for each spaceship, display. Because even with one spaceship and one projectile, I'm almost at the point where this type of coding has just become a little bit too chaotic. So it would be nice to kind of take this code and just refactor it, lose all of these global things, stuff like that. I'll, I'll look into that later on before we do the next big assignment. But it would be nice for you to just kind of set these things up in classes, get these things rolling, work with vectors a little bit. Um, and see if you can add one more thing, which is kind of taking a distance function. Like, we've already worked with the vectors a little bit. If you have two objects in there that are moving, like this projectile and the spaceship, or an other spaceship, or maybe just a, a planet, or a circle, or a box. And see if you can just, every single frame, take the difference between the position of the projectile and the position of the object that you're shooting at, um, calculate the distance, and if that distance has gone below some point, change the color of the object. And as soon as you've done that, you've got a little game where you can try to shoot something. Let's imagine I just draw a little circular planet up here in the corner. I go up here. I shoot. If the projectile goes within a certain distance of the center of that planet, that means I've hit it, and it changes color. You know, little things like this. Definitely use the time now. Um, Benny is here. I, like last time, have to leave early. I'll be here a, a while longer. But he's going to be here just as programming assistance for you. So you can take a break now. That's fine. But I'd like to see you come back in here and, and use this time that we've got allotted for this to actually get going at the programming end and start with these projects. Because as soon as you have something like this going on, you've gone a long way to finishing the next assignment as well. Yes, question. Um, the date on it isn't exactly set, but in about two and a half, three weeks' time, it'll be due. So I'll put it online like at the end of this week or beginning of next, and then you'll have two weeks to finish it. Yes. Verður næsta verkefni tengt þessu eða verður tengt? Það verður tútí aftur. Næsta verkefni verður bara stærra tútí verkefni. Fyrsta verkefni var eiginlega bara passið eða dótið ykkar virki verkefni. Næsta verkefni verður bara tútí tölvuleikur. Í ætt við þetta eða meir eins og breakout eða arkanoid eða víst eiginlega hvað sem er góðs. Þannig að þið viljum bara byrja á því núna. If you just want to start with ideas for the next assignment, the assignment is basically make a 2D game. It's really open, but I'll have some ideas in the description of what games you can do. But if you already have ideas for games, just start doing them and then ask me later if they'll fit into the assignment. So go ahead. Okay. Ja, fimm forðunarverkefni. Það fyrsta er þetta sem er búið. Næsta er tút í geim. Næstu tvö eru saman. Annars vegar shaderarnir og hins vegar geometrísk parturinn af 3D maze. 
og síðast það er svo bara opið fríki verkefni sem ég gerir nánast hvað sem ég vilji Ég myndi ekki hafa mjög afgjörna þessu Þetta er sjúklega að fokka skemmt Þótt þetta, þótt þetta sjá eins og þeirri sjá